Committee will come to order. Let me welcome our witnesses and, and guests for uh, our second hearing this week at the full committee level on cybersecurity. We are very pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses to help us with this challenging area. Uh, for those members who were able to participate in our uh, hearing yesterday, we heard from the private sector and from uh, academia, think tanks, about some of the challenges that we face in cyber. Uh, for questions such as what is the role of the military in defending private infrastructure? Should private uh, industry be able to hack back against those who may uh, try to steal their intellectual property? What does deterrence mean when it comes to cyber? Uh, a number of difficult questions. Um, that, uh, that we talked about some, but uh, we will continue to pursue that, that line today. Cyber, is, as many people say, is a new domain of warfare. And so what that means for the Department of Defense, what that means for our country's national security is uh, very much at or near the top of the agenda for all of us who are involved in, in national security. Before I turn to our distinguished panel of witnesses, I'll yield to the distinguished ranking member for any comments he'd like to make about today's hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing and the one yesterday. Um, our, our outside experts sort of, sort of basically said that the strategy is sound, it's the implementation um, that is key. And obviously, this is a very difficult area of public policy. It's constantly evolving. Uh, the threat changes every single day. Uh, we have to be prepared to, to meet that threat. Uh, I think a lot of it is, you know, having, having the right personnel, having very, very smart people who understand technology, uh, and obviously we have to compete against private industry as we try to bring those folks in. So that, that is definitely a challenge. Uh, coordination is also a challenge. Um, there are so many different pieces of the Department of Defense. Who is in, in charge of cyber strategy and how is it being implemented uh, DOD-wide? Um, because as we all know, uh, the big problem with cyber is the classic single point of failure. Um, you can get absolutely everything right except for one thing and have a disaster. You know, how do we comprehensively make sure uh, that we're, we're taking into account every single one of those points of failure? That's not, not easy to do. Uh, and then some of the questions that the chairman raised about, um, you know, would, when is offensive cyber attacks uh, okay? Uh, what are the rules of the road? And I think that that is a real challenge as we as we deal with China, as we deal with Russia, as um, we deal with with Iran and others. Um, what what are the red lines, and how do we respond um, if someone crosses those red lines? I I know that the agreement that was reached with China on this is unsatisfactory to many, and it's unsatisfactory to me. There's a long way to go. But I think we need to have those types of conversations, uh, certainly with Russia and China, uh, so that we better understand what the rules of the road are, um, so that we can uh, get, get to the point where we don't you know, stumble into something um, greater than we had expected. But uh, I know cyber policy isn't easy, but I look forward to hearing uh, from uh, Deputy Secretary Work uh, and our other witnesses on how we can get our arms around it. And then also, of course, you know, what, what the legislative branch can do uh, to make it easier for you to implement those policies. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, again, I want to thank our distinguished witnesses for being here. We're very uh, pleased to have the Honorable Robert Work, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Admiral Michael Rogers, the Commander of U.S. Cybercom, and Mr. Terry Halverson, the Chief Information Officer for the Department of Defense. Without objection, your full written statements will be made part of the record. Thank you for submitting those. And Ms. Secretary, we'll turn the floor over to you for any comments you'd like to make. Thank you, Chairman Thornberry, Ranking uh, Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting us here this morning to discuss the Department of Defense efforts in cyberspace. As both the uh, Chairman and the Ranking Member said, this is an extremely important issue that we grapple with every day. And so we welcome uh, these types of meetings to discuss the policy issues. As you know, cyber intrusions and attacks on, by both state and non-state actors have increased dramatically uh, in recent years. And particularly troubling to us as the Department of Defense and as a nation are the increased frequency and scale of state-sponsored cyber actors breaching U.S. government and business networks. These adversaries continually adapt and evolve in response to our cyber countermeasures. 
Uh, they threaten our networks and systems of the Department of Defense, our nation's critical infrastructure, and the U.S. companies and interests globally. The recent spate of cyber events that have been in the press, the intrusions into OPM, the Sony, and the Joint Staff Networks by three separate state actors is not just espionage of convenience, but a threat to our national security. As one of our responses to this growing threat, the Department recently released its 2015 DOD Cyber Strategy, uh, which will guide the development of our cyber forces and strengthen our cybersecurity and cyber deterrence posture. We have three core cyber missions as defined in our strategy. First and foremost, and this is what uh, Secretary Carter has made a clear number one priority first, is to defend DOD network systems and information. So that is job number one. Second, we help defend the nation against cyber events of significant consequence. And third, we provide cyber support to operational and contingency plans in support of our combatant commanders. And in this regard, the U.S. Cyber Command may be directed to conduct cyber operations in coordination with other U.S. government agencies as appropriate to deter or defeat strategic threats in that domain. Uh, now, my submitted statement contains additional detail on how we're moving to achieve these goals, but I'd like to highlight a particular focus, which is bolstering our cyber deterrence. This was a big issue yesterday in the Senate Armed Services Committee. I want to up, uh, acknowledge to all of you up front that in the terms of deterrence, we are not where we need to be as a nation or as a department. We do believe that there are some things the department is doing that are working, but we have to improve in this area, and that's why we've revised our cyber strategy. Deterrence is a function of perception, first and foremost. It works by convincing a potential adversary that the cost of conducting the attack far outweigh any potential benefits that they might gain from it. The three main pillars of our strategy are denial, resilience, and cost imposition. We, when we talk about denial, denial means preventing a cyber adversary from achieving uh, their objectives. Resilience is ensuring that our systems will continue to perform their essential military attacks, even in a cyber-contested environment or while under attack. And cost imposition is our ability to make sure cyber adversaries pay a much higher price for the malicious activities than they had hoped for. I'd like to just dive down deep into these three kind of uh, pillars very, very quickly. To deny an attacker the ability to adversely impact our military missions, first and foremost, we have to defend our own information networks and data systems. Now, we've made a lot of investments in this regard, and we believe they are starting to bear fruit. But technical upgrades, this is not just about technical upgrades. Uh, because nearly all successful network exploitations up to this point can be traced to a single or multiple human errors, raising the overall level of individual cybersecurity awareness and performance throughout the department is absolutely paramount. So we're working to transform our DOD cybersecurity culture for the long term by improving human performance and accountability within our systems. As part of this effort, we just recently published a cybersecurity discipline implementation plan and a scorecard, the first of its kind. First time it was uh, implemented was in August of this year. These, we believe, are going to be critical to our strategic goal of defending the networks and securing our data and mitigating risks to our missions. The new scorecard system is reported to the Secretary and me on a monthly basis and it will hold commanders accountable for hardening and protecting their endpoints and critical systems and directs compliance with our overall policy. Denial also means defending the nation against cyber events of significant consequence. The President has directed DOD, working with partnership with other agencies, to be prepared to blunt and stop the most dangerous cyber events against our nation and its infrastructure. There may be times where the President or Secretary of Defense directs DOD and others to conduct a defensive cyber operation to stop a cyber attack from impacting our national interests. And so that means to us we have to build the capabilities to prevent or stop a potential cyber attack from achieving its effect. Now, this is an extremely challenging mission. It requires high-end teams and capabilities, and we're building our cyber mission force and deepening our partners, uh, partnerships with law enforcement and the intelligence community, and we can talk about that in questioning. A second principle of deterrence is improving our resiliency by reducing the ability 
of our adversaries to attack us through cyberspace and protecting our ability to continue to execute missions even while in a degraded cyber environment. Our adversaries unquestionably view DOD cyber dependency as a potential wartime vulnerability. Therefore, we have to have the ability to fight through these cyber attacks as a mission critical function. That means normalizing cybersecurity as part of our mission assurance efforts, building redundancy into our systems whenever they are vulnerable, and training constantly to operate in a contested cyber environment. Our adversaries have to see over time that cyber attacks will not provide them a significant operational advantage, and that will be one of the key aspects of deterrence. The third and final aspect is having the demonstrated capability to respond to cyber or non-cyber with cyber or non-cyber means to impose costs on a potential adversary. The administration has made clear that the United States will respond in a time, manner, and place of our choosing to develop cyber options to hold aggressors at risk if required. Successfully executing our missions in cyberspace requires a whole of government and whole of nation approach. This is a much, much, much more difficult problem than the debates we had over nuclear weapons in the 1950s. Uh, for that reason, DOD continues to work with our partners and other federal departments and agencies, the private sector, and our partners around the world to address the shared challenges we face. Secretary Carter, I think you know, has placed a particular emphasis on partnering with the private sector. We know we do not have all the right answers, and are working with industry uh, will be very, very critical to make sure we have both the cutting edge of technology as well as best practices and procedures. Finally, our relationship with Congress is absolutely critical. We very, very much appreciate the support for DOD cyber activities, uh, both last year and this year, as we understand in the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, I encourage continued efforts to pass legislation on cybersecurity information sharing, on data breach notification, and law enforcement provisions related to cybersecurity which were included in the President's legislative proposal submitted earlier this year. The American people expect us to defend against cyber threats of significant consequence. The Department looks forward to working with this committee and Congress to ensure we continue to take every step possible to confront the substantial cybersecurity risks we face. Thank you for inviting us here today, Mr. Chairman, and the attention you are giving this urgent matter. I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you, sir. Admiral Rogers, thanks for being here. You're recognized. Sir, thank you. Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to appear before you today and before the American people to explain how we are implementing the Department of Defense cyber strategy. I thank you for convening this forum, this forum and for your efforts in this important area. I'm equally pleased to be sitting alongside today Deputy Secretary of Defense Work and the DOD CIO, Terry Halverson. It gives me great pride today to highlight the accomplishments of the uniform and civilian personnel of U.S. Cyber Command and its components. I'm both grateful for and humbled by the opportunity that I've been given to lead this cyber team. U.S. Cyber Command and its subordinate elements have been given a responsibility to direct, operate, and secure the department's systems and networks, which are fundamental to the execution of all of DOD's missions. The department and the nation rely on us to build ready cyber forces and to be prepared to employ them when significant cyber events against the nation require DOD support. We are expected to work closely with other combatant commanders to integrate cyber operations into their broader military missions. Policymakers and commanders alike look to us for cyber options in all phases of operations. Our military is in constant contact with agile learning adversaries in cyberspace, adversaries that have shown the capacity and the willingness to hit soft targets in the U.S. The demand for our cyber forces continues to outstrip supply as we bring more capability online, but we continue to rapidly mature based on real-world experiences and the hard work of the men and women of U.S. Cyber Command and our cyber cyber service cyber components. The Secretary of Defense and the Department of Defense Cyber Strategy direct us to intensify our efforts to defend the United States and its interests in our digital age. It is my intent that we move forward quickly with our partners to build our military capabilities, and I have provided this guidance in a re recently released Commander's Vision and Guidance for U.S. Cyber Command. In line with that guidance, we are building and employing the Cyber Mission Forces. 
We're conducting exercises with our interagency and private sector partners to inform whole of nation responses to crisis in cyberspace. And we are supporting DHS and FBI when directed to defend the nation's critical infrastructure from cyber incidents. We support operational commanders around the world every day. The bottom line is we are being challenged as never before to defend our nation's interests and values in cyberspace against states, groups, and individuals that are using increasingly sophisticated capabilities to conduct cyber coercion, cyber aggression, and cyber exploitation. The targets of their efforts extend well beyond government and into privately owned businesses and personally identifiable information. I welcome this opportunity to elaborate on the progress we've made to date and where we should be focusing going forward to ensure that we continue to stay ahead and deter threats to secure our digital networks and our combat systems to ensure our ability to execute the department's missions. With that, I look forward to your questions and thank you again for taking the time today to spend on this important topic. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Halverson, I understand you do not have a prepared statement but are available to answer questions. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Great. Thank you for being here, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, Admiral Rogers, uh, yesterday we, uh, it, one of our witnesses made the point that in any challenge in warfare, what counts is the net assessment. In other words, we can talk about what we're doing, uh, but what really counts is what the results of that versus what the adversaries are doing. And, and so just at the very highest level, as you look at cyber as a domain of warfare, how would you describe the, the net assessment? Where we are today and where those trends are taking us? Are we in a good direction to, to reduce the vulnerabilities and have the capabilities we need? Are the adversaries moving faster than we are? How would you describe that kind of net net in cyber today? So this is a mission set where I think we have to acknowledge we have at least one, compare, one peer competitor in the form of the Russians. When I look at their level of capability, when I look at their activity, then we have a set of other nation states we pay great, great attention to or are, who I am watching increase their level of investment, increase their capacity and their capability. Um, the Chinese probably the ones that get the most attention, if you will, but they are not alone by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the challenge for us in many ways is we are attempting to overcome literally decades of investment with a very different attitude where redundancy, resiliency and defensibility in terms of our systems, whether they be our networks, whether they be the combat systems and the platforms that we count on to execute our missions. Defensibility, redundancy, and resiliency were, until only recently, they were never core design characteristics. They tended to be something that we thought of after we focused on efficiency, cost, speed. And so we find ourselves trying to overcome literally decades of investment and sunk capital costs, if you will, if I was a business. I think we've got a good strategy, a good vision for where we need to go. The challenge always is you're never as fast as you want to be. So as a commander, the argument I have made with my teams is, so this is all about prioritization team. We've got to step back and assess where do we think the greatest vulnerabilities lie? Where do we think our opponents are most interested in attempting to generate effects against us? And how do we forestall their ability to do that in broad terms? So to summarize, we're getting better, but not better fast enough. I think that's a fair. Mr. Thanks. Chairman, if I could add something to this on the net assessment side. Yes, sir. All of the adversaries that we face are generally, in this regard, are authoritarian powers. We're the most open uh, nation on the earth. It is a tremendous competitive advantage, but it provides, we are much more open on our internet than our adversaries are in their own countries. That makes us inherently more vulnerable. The number of attack surfaces that we have to defend against are very, very much larger. So in terms of net assessment, that is one of the things that we are challenging us and we're trying to sort through. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I, I wanna ask you, uh, on, on the three core missions you laid out, uh, number two is defend the nation against significant cyber attacks. As you know, there's been considerable conversation about what that means. Uh, so if, if I'm a company under cyber attack, when is the government going to come help defend me? And, and I realize you probably can't put a dollar threshold or, or something 
very specific on what that means, a significant cyber event, but can you help clarify for us when the Department of Defense becomes engaged in defending the country and, and what that means, significant cyber event? I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary, is your microphone on? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. Uh, you're exactly right. We're, we're obligated to defend the nation against uh, cyber attacks or cyber activities of significant consequence, and that is not a uh, purely defined term. Each attack would be looked at. Uh, so, for example, uh, did the attack result in any death, uh, injury, significant destruction was associated with it? Was it an act of espionage? Was it an act of cyber crime? In other words, was it a non-state actor who was trying to get a PII? But a significant consequence would be things which would uh, go against our national critical infrastructure, uh, and this would be decided uh, primarily with the Department of Homeland Security, which would have the lead on attacks against uh, within the United States on critical infrastructure, and we would then work through with the policies uh, to uh, make an appropriate response. Uh, Admiral Rogers works this constantly, so I think he would be very well placed to answer this question, too. Um, I, I would agree completely with the Secretary. It, it explains why the response to Sony, for example, is very different than the response to OPM. We try to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis given a specific set of facts, and we're clearly still working our way through some of these broader definitions. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Well, I appreciate it. I think other members may want to follow up. I mean, you look at OPM and huge consequences for our national security. I presume if you had seen it occurring, then there would have been action taken to prevent it. Um, but it's, it's uh, large consequences, even for the theft of information that did not result in, in death, we trust. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you. And I know you can't talk about this in an open setting in terms of what our response has been um, to some of these cyber attacks, but can I ask if, you know, you feel that response has been effective? Um, has it deterred more attacks? Um, at this point, how, how comfortable are you that our responses to, and again, there are, as you've laid out, levels of cyber attacks. And when you pass a certain level, then you know, we feel like there a response is appropriate. Now, have those responses been at all effective in your view at this point? And how would you define effectiveness? I would say at this point, we don't believe that we're, our deterrence uh, policy has been effective up to this point, or as effective as it should be. Uh, and that's why we want to strengthen it. Uh, as we talked, uh, one of the problems is attribution. So the first thing is, where did the attack come from? A geographical location. Then who was the actor who the attack came from? And then did the state control the actor or was the actor operating uh, independently? So that will tell you whether it's a law enforcement response, whether it should be economic sanctions, whether it should be offensive or defensive cyber operations. And I believe what we have to do is have a very uh, strong policy on cost imposition, which we are working towards. and we have announced, uh, and then we have to prove that through our actions. So I would say that we are not where we would want to be in terms of deterrence right now. And I did, following up on that, how, how effective are you at figuring out where the attack came from? Now, I understand there's the final piece of that is the one that's really most difficult, is even if you were to determine who the actor was, um, was that person acting on their own or acting at the behest of, of a government? But how effective are you at when an attack comes in saying, all right, tracing it back and saying, that's, that's the person who did it? Um, we continue to gain increased insight and knowledge in that area. If you look, for example, using Sony as an illustrative example, we were very quickly able to determine the nation state and the specific actor within the nation state. Um, I think that's one reason, again, why you saw you know, a policy response that was relatively quick. We're able to provide policymakers with a high level of confidence as to who did it, how they did it. Um, it, it really varies, although I will say we are watching actors around the world as they realize that we are gaining increased capability in our ability 
to attribute cyber activities, specific nation states, specific groups. It's interesting watching them now attempt to obscure that, create different relationships, use different processes. So this is one, of, as was indicated in the opening, the dynamics here just change so quickly. It's the nature of this. I don't see that fundamental changing anytime soon. Right. And this is some, um, one of the problems is we have a very strong policy that we will respond in a place and a time and a manner of our own choosing. And the problem with this is it's not like uh, it can happen sometimes very, very quickly. First, we have to go through the attribution phase. Then we have to determine was it cyber crime? Was it an independent actor? Was the actor responding in charge of the state? Then what are the appropriate responses? That might be a law enforcement measure. It might be economic sanctions. It might be offensive or defensive cyber operations. It could be military operations, uh, depending on the uh, uh, damage or threat of the attack to our nation. So this is much, much different than nuclear uh, deterrence, where you can attribute the attack immediately, generally, and you have uh, specific response options already uh, ready. Uh, in this case, it's a much more whole of government approach that takes more time. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. I uh, <clears throat> Can you give, you know, this is the new world we all live in. We all know that. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I, uh, I'm getting to a question in just a moment, but I bank with the uh, credit union here in Washington. So last Saturday, I started calling 24-hour banking to find out what kind of what, what was in my account. Uh, as of today, they're not online. Well, I'm certainly not saying that is a cyberspace invasion of anything, but it's just the complexities of the world we're living in now. So when I hear your testimony, I want to first say thank you for who you are and what you're doing. My next, my question would be, at this point, knowing that we are constantly here in Washington, worried about a shutdown, worried about the debt growing, I, I will never forget, I've had reason to call Admiral Mullen recently, of course he's retired, the former chairman, I have great respect for him, uh, on a totally different subject. And I've used many times back in my district, the third district of North Carolina, the home of Camp Lejeune, Cherry Point, I've used many times what he said when he was chairman. The biggest threat to our military is the debt of our nation. What I would like to know, as you move forward to give us the very best protection that you can, what type of financial commitment should the taxpayers and the Congress understand that we need to make to ensure that we've got the best protection? I believe we've been uh, very clear, uh, sir, that uh, the President's uh, request, the PB-16 request, we believe is the absolute minimum needed to provide the national security necessary for the United States. Um, I would just like to say, uh, I uh, was talking with the Chairman just before this, and we are very, very thankful, or we hope, that we will avoid a, uh, a shutdown. This would be extremely disruptive. I think uh, Admiral Rogers can tell you the last time we went through a shutdown, it set us back six months in terms of preparing our cyber mission uh, force. Uh, so we believe the PB-16 level is the absolute minimum. Uh, I'd also like to say that, you know, in the last six years, we've been under a CR for two years of the six years. In each of the first quarters of the fiscal year, We've been under a CR for about 93% of the time. In essence, we are operating on a nine-month fiscal year. There is no COO in the United States who could operate under this, uh, this type of uncertainty, and uh, we hope that the CR will be handled uh, or will be resolved as quickly as possible. So I very much thank, thank the question, sir. Uh, this is an important thing. I hope that we will be able to resolve our differences on the budget level and provide for their national security. Well, if I, I could. Uh, excuse I'll, me, go ahead, Admiral, the, please. The only other comment I would make is, and I think it goes to the point you're trying to make, there shouldn't be any doubt in anyone's mind that there is a cost component to all of this. Um, that as a department, we try to prioritize that because we clearly realize there's many competing requirements and resources are tight for the nation, and we certainly understand that. But there, there just shouldn't be any doubt that there is a cost 
component to that, and that cost may change over time, but it isn't going. I don't think it's going to get cheaper for us, at least in the near term, not with the level of activity that you see out there every day. And Congressman Jones, I will tell you that regardless of the level of our budget, Secretary Carter has made it clear that cyber defense and cybersecurity is going to be at the very, very top of our priority list. So whatever budget we receive, cyber will receive the attention that we believe it deserves. Well, I believe that uh, the shutdown would probably be avoided, which, you know, not getting into the politics of that, but I think it probably will be. And uh, I, I think you all uh, have done a great job. I think the American people, like me, I'm not talking about my colleagues, have really understood that this threat of cyberspace warfare in any form is probably at the foremost that, as you said, Admiral, will grow and the threat will become more and more. So I thank you, gentlemen, for being here today and your testimony. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of you for being here. And as you know, we heard from outside groups, the private sector yesterday, and I think you spoke, certainly, Mr. Secretary, to the importance of that partnership. One of the, the questions I basically asked them was, you know, what hampers that relationship? What hampers moving forward? And they spoke of the regulatory burden that's placed on companies wishing to work and partner with the DOD. And particularly for newer companies who don't have a history of working with the government. And so I'm wondering, how can we make that process easier? Do you think that's an appropriate uh, uh, analysis or, or response? Uh, you may feel that you've done everything you can to assist in that way, but obviously there's a different response. The other issue is really whether or not we're kind of losing out on working with some of the best minds in the business because we just make it so difficult for them to work with the Department of Defense. Congresswoman, I'd ask uh, uh, Terry Halverson, our CIO, who works extensively with the private sector to answer your question. I think he's the best to, uh, to do that. Thank you, sir. I think there is absolutely some truth that we've got to get better at bringing in particularly newer companies. Um, I think first we have to understand if, if DOD was a Fortune 500 company, we're Fortune 1. I mean, we're very big. That in itself causes us some difficulty with companies that do not have experience with us. So in the last year, some of the things that we have done to make that better, we have reached out, as many of you have seen, to, to Silicon Valley. We're holding different uh, events to make industry clearer. One of the things that we did last year, which I thought was one of the bigger breakthroughs, you probably asked me a little bit later about cloud. One of the things we did to make cloud easier for people to play and easier for industry to get in, we wrote our new cloud policy completely with industry. First time we've done that. They actually, we, we convened them, we brought them in from the beginning. We had leading industry providers like Amazon on the panel to write that. We've gotten very good reviews from that. We've got to continue to do that. This year we are going to bring some industry players into to the DOD CIO staff and some of the other service CIO staff. We'll actually do exchange with industry. Some of that will be focused on some of the new industries so that we learn how they need to respond and how we need to respond. So we have to do better. I think we are doing better in that area, and I, I think you'll see more results in the next six, seven months coming down that we'll be able to concretely show you what we've done to improve that relationship. Yeah, that's good to hear. I think we have to continue to, to push and, and obviously ask them how, how that's working. I guess we also would agree that in the procurement areas that, again, maybe there's some better ways of doing it and uh, everybody talks about it, but sometimes it feels like nothing's getting done. So I wanted to ask you as, as well in terms of the um, hiring as well, because in the personnel areas, we know that we're not as adaptive in hiring as obviously as the private sector is. What are we doing uh, to make sure that in the field of cybersecurity that we're able to push through nominations to positions so that it's, they don't have to wait so long that they go ahead and take those jobs in the private sector? Two things, uh, and first of all, let me thank all of you. You did pass uh, good legislation that give, uh, gave Mike Rogers and I some more authority to directly hire uh, people without having some of the, the normal rules and regulations that we have to follow so we could compete. Um, I know there's some work on some additional. We would appreciate that. 
Um, I think one fact we just have to understand, we are not going to pay exactly as much as industry and in the cybersecurity area and some other areas. One of the things we have going for us, we have a pretty exciting mission. So when I talk to, and I spend a lot of time talking to people who want to come to work for DOD, we're trying to attract them, um, and we have been able to pull some people in even the last year into my staff. Um, as long as we can get them in fast and, and offer them the right wage, which the new authority gives us, I think we'll be able to continue in the, in the right role. They want to work this mission. Uh, and your legislation that usually passed has really helped us with that. Thank you. If Thank I could you. just add, this is one area where I suspect over time we may in fact end up coming back to you as our experience tells us, are there things we could be doing differently? Are there challenges here we need your help in overcoming? Because I always remind people, look, while we spend a lot of time focused on technology, don't ever underestimate. At its heart, this is an enterprise powered by men and women, and they are our advantage, and that's where we need to make sure we're getting really good talent. To date, I would argue at the mission force level that the execution piece for us, we are, have been able to exceed our expectations, both in terms of ability to bring in quality people as well as retaining them. Perhaps uh, some chart showing the differences as, as a result of some of these changes would be really helpful in mm -hmm. understanding how, what the impact has really been. Thank you. Thank you. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we, we stand ready to work with you all uh, on those authorities as we assess how they're doing. That's very important. Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And can I reiterate what Mr. Jones said in thanking each of you for what you do for our country and for being here today? Mr. Secretary, you probably think strategically and um, analytically on national defense issues as well as anybody we have in government today, and we appreciate and respect your opinions as you come before this committee. Uh, I'd like to follow up on some questions that the chairman offered uh, specifically related to net assessment. And one of the things that I just want to ask, um, as you're aware, some of the best strategies we, we've developed over the years have been informed and supported by the practice of net assessment. Has DOD done um, any net assessments of the cyber domain at this particular point in time? Well, as you know, uh, sir, we just had a leadership change in uh, the Office of Net Assessment. Uh, it reflects Secretary Carter's uh, uh, very strong support of that office and providing independent assessments to uh, him and I. Uh, Jim Baker, who is the new director, uh, is just gotten in and is going to come back in. Cyber security and cyber uh, is at the very top of our list, but there are many, many other strategic challenges, as you know. Uh, this one is going to be one that I believe ONA is going to help us on, but there I know of no, nothing at this point as far as an ongoing assessment, uh, but we expect to be able to start uh, asking and Mr. Baker. not a, a criticism, it's an encouragement as the chairman talks about net assessment. If we haven't done a net assessment of that, it's kind of difficult to know where we are. So I think we would just encourage perhaps the department, if it can, to do what it can to, to have that net assessment done. And the, because I, I do think it helps to um, uh, us in determining what our strategies are going to be. The second part of that is I know you have worked very, very hard and very, very well on a third offset strategy. Do you expect that cyber will be a part of that third offset strategy? Absolutely. Um, we assume that the future will be an extremely highly contested cyber and electronic warfare environment. So no matter what strategy we have, that kind of is the underlying baseline that we assume uh, we must be able to contend with. Uh, there are a lot of questions on whether or not uh, many people say, well, if you go to a more network force, are you going to be able to have the, uh, the certainty that you will have the networks when you need them? Will you have the confidence? So it will be absolutely critical to the third offset. Yes. And once again, just an encouragement, the net assessment often really helps us inform what we're doing, that having that net assessment done would be, I think, very helpful. Admiral Rogers. Um, do you think we need to leverage a wider range of tools like sanctions or diplomacy, criminal proceedings to deter cyber attacks with the threat of punishment? And can you tell us a little bit more about what options you think would be most effective at imposing cost upon perpetrators? Chairman Wilson and I, for example, have introduced legislation calling for targeted economic sanctions, but I'm not asking you to address that bill. Right. But what else? What do we have? What else do we need, in so, your opinion? That has been part of our strategy to date. 
that just because someone comes at us in the cyber domain doesn't mean the response has to be primarily or purely back in that same arena, if you will. You see that reflected in the response to the attack in Sony, for example, where we publicly acknowledged the event, we publicly attributed the event, and we talked about an initial set of actions we were gonna take in response, in this case it was economic sanctions, and then the president also talked about, and we will take additional action if that is required, we believe, at the time and place of our choosing. We have used the legal framework uh, within the last year where we have indicted individuals of foreign states, individual actors, we've indicted them. Um, we have done the economic piece. There's a broad range of options that are ongoing law enforcement and what the FBI, for example, does every and day. To don't, I hate to interrupt you, but no, I only no. have a, a 50 seconds, and I'd just like to ask you this. Um, Secretary Wark said that we were, have not been as effective up to date as we would like to be, fair. Uh, uh, no, again, no criticism, just no. an observation. Um, what do you attribute that to? Is it our lack of willingness to use the tools we have, or does this committee need to help you get more tools? Uh, what, what would you say is your assessment of how we make that more effective? I, mean, I think clearly there's a broad range of tools available to the nation to include cyber options. One of my particular responsibilities is to be able to generate cyber options so that the secretary has options to tee up. Um, we're in the relatively early stages of the journey, but we are on that journey and we have developed some levels of capabilities already. I'm not gonna get into specifics. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge in some ways is just time. I mean, we're in the very early stages of this. And if you look at, for example, if you use speaking of time, um, my time is up. But if you don't mind, um, yes, I, we would submit some questions okay. on the record, and maybe you can respond back be glad to, to that. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And then I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Rhode Island, who's been a leader in this area for some time, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member, as well as Chairman Wilson, uh, for the time and attention that you and the committee have put into focusing on cyber, and, and Mr. Secretary and Admiral, and uh, Ms. Tabberson, I want to thank you for your testimony here today. Uh, I think that the discussion we've been having on imposing costs on our enemies and adversaries uh, is, is critically important. And uh, I'm not gonna ask a question on this today, but I will say that uh, the, I know the, the, the committee, and certainly I'm gonna pay uh, a lot of attention on this. We are looking for specifics about what those costs being imposed on our enemies and adversaries uh, will be. I know the American people looking for answers on this because right now, up until now, our enemies, adversaries uh, have been eating our lunch for a long time, especially when it comes to cyber espionage, especially when it comes to uh, things like defense contractors over the years. And I know we've gotten better and we've had the DIB pilot in place now and the follow on program that has done a better job of de defending our uh, uh, defense contractors and the like. But uh, imposing costs on our enemies and adversaries has to be an important part of the equation and they have to know what it is. I know some of our responses may be classified, but others we need to make public so that uh, our enemies know, or adversaries know that they, they can't operate with impunity, which is what really is happening right now. It's like the Wild West out there and, and they're on the, the better side of the equation. We've got to flip that uh, so we have better outcomes uh, on our side. Um, so we, let me just turn to another topic. Uh, do you believe, uh, and the Secretary, we'll start with you, uh, that there is uh, an effective uh, accountability mechanism in place for reported cybersecurity breaches at defense contractors. And could you describe uh, to us the process by which contractors are held accountable? Um, Congressman, I do believe we have an effective uh, means. Uh, we're getting better. We've established our own cyber scorecard. Uh, this has been one of uh, CIO Halverson's top job, so I'd ask him to answer the question on, with more specifics. Thank you, sir. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, sir, we, we actually have improved the DIB process, which brings and gives um, the companies better ability to share data with us. It protects them and gives them some protection when they share that data with us. That has been uh, very successful. We've also improved our ability working with industry to look at the supply chain risk management um, I won't go into everything we've done there, but what we have, what basically we've done is we're sharing it and we are putting some systems in place with the industry to be able to see uh, that data better. We have now included working very much with industry to include now language that's in all IT and cyber contracts that requires certain levels of security and reporting. 
all of those things are beginning to show results. And one way that we impose cost on them is to raise our basic level of cyber defense and make, that, make them play much higher to play the game. And the things we are doing, I believe we are now starting to see some effects in that area about who isn't playing as much anymore and what they're having to, to pay to play. Thank you. So I've been examining the practices and techniques in the financial sector is using to determine, uh, to, uh, determine and, and address the cyber risks of, of their contractors and vendors. And uh, in many ways, they are way out ahead of what the government uh, is doing. To what degree uh, have you cribbed from uh, civilian sector best practices? Sir, very much so. And, and, I, and I, I would say that we are, we share a lot. And in the financial sector in particular, um, they've just published some new standards about what they expect from their vendors. If you looked at what they wrote and you looked at what we wrote in ours, they're very similar. Um, that was actually a fairly collaborative effort with the financial industry. We are also doing that with other segments of, of industry, with the logistics companies and, and other things. So we are cribbing a lot from industry. I spend a lot of time on our mobility policy. You will see that as that comes out, that will be completely, again, written with industry playing right from the beginning to help us get those pieces right so that we get the advantage of effectiveness and efficiency while we are using industry practices to raise the level of the security. Thank you. Can you describe for us the Department's progress on the creation of persistent training environments of the type and scale necessary to conduct group and collective training, uh, rehearse missions at the unit level, as well as integrate and exercise the full spectrum of national, state, local, and private sector capabilities? So we identified that as a core enabler for us to build the vision to actually create the capability we think we need. Um, in fact, this is one I actually, Deputy Secretary Work and I worked directly on this where I said, hey boss, I could use some more help here in fiscal year 15. He was kind enough to generate additional funds for us. We've created a capability down in Suffolk, Virginia. In fact, we have been using it now every year with the guard and the interagency to look at how we can model different scenarios where DOD would be applying the capabilities to support critical infrastructure. In addition, we've generated a capability at the Fort Meade area that we can increasingly port out across the framework for us. This has been a big investment area. You see it in the 16 budget as well, and we thank you for your support for that. And in, uh, the, in our PB17 build, Congressman, uh, Secretary Carter has again uh, defense of the networks is number one. Uh, improving training is uh, right up there. Uh, so this is going to have, have a very, very high um, level of attention from the top down. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. As, as I mentioned to our witnesses earlier, Mr. Smith and I have to go testify ourselves in front of the Rules Committee. So I'm pleased to yield the chair and yield for questions he may submit to the uh, Chairman of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee, Mr. Wilson. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a unique uh, situation where I uh, have just been recognized and get to preside simultaneously. Uh, but uh, I, it really gives me an opportunity to thank Chairman Mac Thornberry, Ranking Member Smith, uh, for their planning this week, uh, Cyber Week. Uh, it, it's really a recognition uh, for our three witnesses how important what you're doing, protecting American families. And so I'm very grateful we had a hearing yesterday on uh, cyber threats uh, to American families. The, uh, our national defense. Uh, we have this hearing uh, later this afternoon. We have a briefing. Uh, I want the American people to know that we've got really good people like uh, Congressman Jim Langevin all the way from Rhode Island, who is the uh, ranking member of the Emerging Threat Subcommittee. I, uh, this really is a bipartisan uh, issue that we face uh, of great concern uh, of uh, attacks on uh, our government, on private businesses, on uh, American citizens, and what you're doing is so important. We've also got extraordinary staff people who are here uh, uh, working on these issues. Uh, and, and again, each one of you in your uh, capacity are making such a difference, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, in particular, Secretary Work, uh, during the cyber hearing yesterday, and uh, the Chairman mentioned his opening statement about the concept and proposal of hackback. For example, when a private company takes retaliation into their own hands and hacks back at someone who has attacked their networks or systems, can you outline concerns that you have? And is hack back uh, inherently uh, a government function 
uh, that only the government should do, or is, or is there a private role? Well, this is a very, very important issue for us because uh, cyber attacks often have second and third and fourth order consequences that we really have to understand, that they may cause escalation that were, were unintended. So this is an extremely important policy question for us as a nation to grapple with. Admiral Rogers deals with this on a daily basis, and I'd ask him to provide some specifics. So I, I not only acknowledge the policy complications, but um, I also try to point out at an operational level, we have so many actors in this domain already, adding more with um, only complicates things. The second and third order effects, as the Secretary has outlined, are of significant concern. And so I have, from my perspective, urge be very careful about going down this road, because I don't think it's one that we truly understand. And from my perspective, the potential to further complicate an already complicated situation is very significant here. And as complicated as it is, I, I, um, I'm just so hopeful uh, that with the uh, expertise that you have, to me, it, it would be a deterrence uh, with some level of hackback. And so I, I hope uh, this is uh, pursued uh, and, uh, and the capable people that you are and that you have working with you, uh, I, um, I, I can't wait to hear of uh, their uh, capabilities of, uh, as a deterrence, uh, stopping uh, hacking uh, on American families. Uh, and uh, Mr. Halverson, the department recently issued a new manual for the defense support of civil authorities which is the first time addresses cybersecurity related incidents. Could you discuss how DOD gets requests for such support, especially if it might be coming from a state or local agency? Yes, sir, is the manual is out. We, there are some formal processes we, w we would go through with that. But one of the things I would, would I take a minute to stress is the informal processes that we have put in place. We have now scheduled routine meetings with the industry, CISOs, my CISO, Richard Hale, who you'll I think hear from later today in a, in, a, in a closed hearing, has scheduled meetings with their security officers, both officially and unofficially, so we are sharing that data. We're moving forward to be able to give them some of our data quicker. Mike's work has been superb in being able to lower the classification levels of data so that we can share that much quicker with industry and accept theirs in a, in a similar fashion. So I think all of those things, plus what's in the manual, are adding to our all of us, industry and the government's collection of data and, and what I'll call operational intelligence that we can use to better security. And I would also add, this is an argue where we, this is an issue where we collaborate very closely between the Northern Command Commander, U.S. Cyber Command, the Department of Homeland Security, the Guard and Reserve, the FBI, about how can we make sure that we're most effective and most efficient about how we're going to apply DOD capacity within the cyber arena, within the broader defense support to civil authority construct, because um, I'm trying to make sure, can we use that existing framework to the maximum extent possible, as opposed to trying to create something new, something totally complex in the cyber arena? And Admiral, thank you for uh, pitching in. I want you to know, as a uh, very grateful Navy dad, uh, I, uh, with three sons in the Army Guard, but I, uh, I'm very uh, grateful for your service and, and, and Naval service in general. Uh, Secretary Work, in your testimony, you stated Quote, the Iranian actors have been implicated in the 2012-2013 attacks against U.S. financial institutions and in February 2014, last year, cyber attack on the Las Vegas Sands Casino. What economic sanctions or legal actions uh, resulted from this uh, activity? Uh, are they being maintained? Sir, I'm going to have to take that for the record. I don't know exactly what... Uh, sanctions, the DDoS attack that you uh, uh, refer to against the financial uh, services was attributed to Iran, as well as the uh, Sands Casino, as you said. Uh, I'm going to have to get back to you on, uh, uh, and say exactly what uh, we did as a result of those two attacks. But Mike might know. Um, no specific sanctions tied to those each individual discrete events. Clearly a broader discussion about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. We have seen a change in behavior. The activity that we had seen previously directed against financial websites, for example, has decreased in part, I think, because of the broader, very public discussion we were having in which we were acknowledging the activity and we were partnering between the government and the financial sector to see what we could do to work the resiliency piece here to preclude the Iranians' ability to actually penetrate, which, knock on wood, we were successful with. 
And again, thank each of you. We now proceed to Mr. Larson of Washington State. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, any any uh, any of you can answer this question. I'm curious, though, are we still ex are we still exploring what the outer limits of what constitutes the equivalent of a physical kinetic attack against the U.S. Uh, when we're looking at cyber attacks? Do we still know what would be the equivalent kind of cyber attack that would warrant the kind of uh, and size of response that we might do if there was a physical kinetic attack against the U.S.? Are we exploring the outer limits still? Well, we've defined an, an event of significant consequence. It has to include either a loss of life, significant damage to property, serious adverse U.S. foreign policy implications or consequences, or serious economic impact. Now, that's a broad statement, and each of them have to be addressed as an individual act, and that's why there's no established red line on what we would say this constitutes a physical attack. Uh, the question we are often asked is, when does a cyber attack trigger an act of war? And each of those would be discussed in turn depending on the uh, type of attack and what its consequences were. Uh, as of this point, we have not assessed that any particular attack on us has constituted an act of war. Can you, uh, and, and Admiral, you address a little bit, be more specific about the Title 10 versus Title 32 responsibilities and working with the National Guard, or even going beyond that, working with uh, either national, state, or local law enforcement? Right. What specific uh, criteria do you use to make that distinction? For me, among the things I look at are scope of the activity we're dealing with the nature of the event that we're trying to deal with, capacity that exists within the Title 10 arena versus in the Title 32. Are there specific knowledge or unique insights that, for example, a, a particular guard structure might have that are really well tailored to, to deal with this specific issue? Uh, again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. The, the touchstones, though, I have tried to maintain with my guard teammates and the states is, we need one integrated workforce between the active and the reserve component trained to the same standard using the same basic schema maneuver so that we can use these capabilities interchangeably. That maximizes our flexibility as a department and it gives us a broad range of options in terms of how we employ the capability. And then are, are you making that largely uh, permanent? Um, some, at some point in the future, you've moved on to something else and someone comes in behind you. So is, are these, is this still evolving how you're trying to establish these uh, relationships as they apply to cyber, or are these going to be in largely largely permanent? We're going to be changing the story. Right. In the I think they'll be largely permanent. Um, I feel pretty good that we've done the foundational work, if you will, broadly. I always remind people, um, remember, no plan ever survives contact. And, and the broad framework we're going to acknowledge as we get into this, we're likely to see things we hadn't anticipated, and we've got to be flexible and be willing to to change as we need to, given the specifics of whatever particular event it is that we're dealing with. But I would compliment the Guard and the Reserve for the, the way we have partnered on developing the cyber capability within the department. It hasn't been adversarial at all. It's been a great team. In fact, I'd like to jump in on that, sir. The, we work very closely with the Council of Governors. I'd like to give them a shout out. Uh, we have been dealing with this on how to build up cyber capacity in the Guard and Reserve. Uh, we are building right now towards about 2,000 uh, guard and reserves uh, that are associated with this. Uh, and what we are doing right now is trying to work out the policy on what our folks can do in terms of coordination, training, advising, and assist under Title 32 and Title 10 authorities. Um, that is actually, policy is working well. We're working well with the governors, and uh, we believe that this is going to be a great news story uh, for the nation. Great. Just my, and my uh, last uh, few moments here, I have a question. We talked about Defensive networks, defense of networks, that is. Um, talked about resilience, um, denial, and the whole deterrence issue. But this issue of hybrid warfare, of course, has come up, and I'm curious about what steps you're taking to incorporate in a U.S. response or in, even in NATO's response and the role CyberCom plays in this and in incorporating um, a responsive capability of. In, within this hybrid warfare concept that uh, hear really a lot out of uh, out of General Breedlove. So, uh. 
So it, it's a concept we're partnering both with General Breedlove at UCOM as well as in his NATO role as the Supreme Allied Commander. I'd also highlight the work that Special Operations Command and the General Votel's team are doing in this regard. In fact, I was just down in Tampa about 10 days ago. This was part of our broad discussion about how do we integrate the full range of capabilities within the department as we're trying to, to respond to an evolving world around us. The, I think we're starting to have some good conversations and a good broad way ahead within the department. The international framework for this a little more difficult. I, I think it's fair to say not as far as advanced, for example, with us in NATO. Um, it's an area we've talked about we've got to work on. My time's up. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you, Mr. Larson. We now proceed to Congressman Doug Lambert of Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciated your comments to earlier questions uh, that were directed from Congresswoman Susan Davis, but I'd like to follow up and build on that. This is concerns recruiting and retaining top talent. So uh, what are your efforts to and this is for you, Admiral Rogers, in particular. What are your efforts to develop a unique cyber career track for those in the military? So services have the responsibility for man, train, and equip within our department in terms of they generate the capacity I employ as the Joint Commander. In the cyber arena, though, one of the things that has been a, been a real strength is the joint world and the services have been totally integrated as to how we're going to develop this, what are the standards, what are the skills, how do we create that workforce. And that's what I did, in fact, in my last job. Um, I'm very comfortable with how each service has tried to create a career path that enables us to extend over an entire career both this capability as well as generate the insights we need in the workforce. I think that's a big change for us over the last five, 10 years. I think it's a real strength for the future. It, it's not an area that I look at now and I go, wow, I have real heavy concerns there. I think we got a good way ahead and a good broad vision and the capacity and the capability of that workforce, I have yet to run in, knock on wood, with my luck, this will happen tomorrow, but I have not yet run into a scenario where we didn't have the level of knowledge. The challenge has been, I might have had a handful of people with the right level of knowledge, but we had people with the knowledge. I've got to build that capacity out more. So we got more of it, if you will. Okay, well, I appreciate hearing that. That's really encouraging, so thank you. And Secretary Work, um, the department has recently floated a number of new civilian and military personnel reforms, uh, compensation, retirement, et cetera. How will some of these reforms affect the cyber workforce? Well, that's, I actually was going to try to jump in here because this is a huge priority for Secretary Carter. Uh, he came into the departments uh, believing that over time we have created these barriers for service in our, our government. And he wants to really, as he talks, uh, burrow tunnels through these barriers or widen the aperture. And uh, he uses cyber as an example of new ways in which we might bring people into the government and allow them to serve for a while, then go back out into the uh, civilian workforce and come back in and so he has challenged us and the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, Brad Carson, on this force of the future to say, how can we make sure that in areas like cyber, uh, you know, space, uh, space, electronic warfare, we have more permeability in the department to make sure that we're getting the best from ideas from outside the department. I don't have any specifics to give you right now because they're in the process of uh, going through a deliberative uh, which ideas are good, but we are right with the intent of your question uh, to improve the ways in which people can come in and out of our government service because as uh, Mr. Halverson said, this is an exciting mission for many, many people and uh, maybe they don't want to make a 30-year government career, but if they had a chance to help Admiral Rogers for a two or three year period, they are all in. So we have to improve the way to do that. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Halverson, do you have anything to add to what has already been said? The same uh, comments. And, and, and while we're waiting for some of that to be staffed, you heard we are moving forward on some pilot programs to bring industry in to the government for us to put, for the first time, civilians out in industry. Um, those pilots are, are moving very well. And as we use those to inform Brad and his work, I think you'll see some great things coming out of this. Well, I thank you for your answers, and most of all, thank you for the great work that you're doing. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. We now proceed to Congresswoman Nikki Sangas of Massachusetts. 
Uh, thank you all for being here. It's obviously a topic of, of great importance. And I think, uh, as you uh, said, it, so much of this is about personnel, really being able to attract the people and keep the people uh, who have the skill set and the commitment to thinking this through, because uh, it's not easy stuff, that's for sure, uh, at all. And I gather from the testimony I've heard that there's a fair amount of comfort level with what uh, DOD and the military services have been able to do uh, to uh, put in place appropriate means of, of uh, training, hiring, and then compensating, even though uh, you have said you may have to come back to us in the future. But you've also commented that this is sort of an interagency effort, and you're working with the Department of Homeland Security, law enforcement, the FBI, the intelligence community. How much sharing across those borders is taking place in terms of the skill set that you need in each of those uh, aspects of this effort? And how comfortable are you with the ways in which you're working together and how they're responding to the challenges they face in terms of personnel? I mean, I would argue very well. I mean, I, for example, this is one I have personally sat down with the director of the FBI and talked about, hey, are there things we could be doing together? It's a conversation I've had with the leadership at Homeland Security. It's a conversation, quite frankly, I've also had with the private sector where I've argued we're both competing for the same pool. What works for you? What might we be able to do differently? Are there ways, as you've heard previously, can we partner? I would make just one slight twist because this is a point I wanted to make today. I would tell you on the opposite side, though, the single greatest perturbation I've experienced with, um, with my workforce in 18 months has been even the hint of a shutdown. In the last week, I've had more agitation out of the workforce arguing this would be the second time in two years and we're even having this discussion, hey, even if we don't shut down the government, just the fact that we're even getting this close, the workforce is very open with us about, I'm not so sure I wanna be part of an organization where I, there's this lack of control and I can't count on stability. That really concerns me because I can't overcome that. Secretary Work, do you have any? Well, we are, uh, this is a very competitive field, as the Admiral said. We're building up a total of 133 cyber teams in the cyber mission force. Some are focused on protection of the networks. They're called cyber protection teams. Some are focused on national infrastructure protection. They're called the national mission teams. Then we have teams that are supporting our combatant commanders. We want to build to a total of 133 of these teams. It's going to be about 6,200 active duty military, civilians, and in some special instances, contractors. And we won't get there until 2018. So we are in the process of building these. And this is a co very competitive space. We're on track. We're doing well in our recruitment. But as Admiral Rogers says, uh, any hints of shutdown or sequestration, that will really set us back. So we think we've got a good mission that people want to, want to participate in. Uh, but we are not where we need to be yet, uh, Congresswoman. We still have until 2018 to build up the force to where we just think is the minimum necessary uh, to do our missions. You know, I serve on the board of one of the service academies, the board of visitors of one of the service academies. And I know in our discussions, we have heard that it's been difficult to attract uh, young, young airmen, in this instance, to the cyber field because they come into the academy with a particular uh, idea in mind of where they want to spend their time. And so uh, it's not always as simple as, as we would like to think, given the extraordinary challenge. But I have another question as well. Um, you know, the department has shown its commitment to leveraging private sector cyber innovation, and we've heard about that here today. Uh, I commend Secretary Carter with making his way out to Silicon Valley to uh, create some presence there, a satellite campus there, to be, have a way in which to interact uh, more easily with that, that community. And I just wonder, how will you expand that program and look to other parts of the country where you have a deep bench of cyber uh, cyber activists, cyber uh, innovators, uh, cyber experts. Well, you're referring, uh, Congresswoman, to the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, and it is an experimental unit. We want to see how we can interact with the uh, private sector in the best way. So, for example, one of our ideas was to bring uh, people back to the Pentagon and show them what we're doing. But they said, no, really what we want to do is go to the field and see what your airmen, uh, soldiers, uh, uh, Marines and sailors, what do they do? We want to go on ships. We want to see what their problem. We want to help them. So 
once we do the lessons learned there, we expect that to be a successful and it will become a permanent unit. And then where would we expand? We would go to other innovation centers throughout the country, perhaps Boston. There are different places. And uh, Mr. Halverson has been helping us think through this also. Yeah, as you know, as the uh, Secretary went out to Silicon Valley, we had also taken a CIO team to Silicon Valley. Um, in December, we're doing a similar thing in Boston, in New York. Um, and, and not just waiting that, we have hosted just recently a group down from Boston in New York, of uh, both some of the more um, mature cyber companies, but also a group of some of the innovative companies. I, I think what we're trying to do with DIOX is, is really take what Silicon Valley stands for, not the geographic location, and make sure, and the Secretary has been very clear in his guidance, so is DEFSEC DEF to us, to, hey, it's more about the concept of innovation. Reach to wherever that is, and it's not just in Silicon Valley. So you will see us in the next couple of months spend some more attention in, in the Northeast and, frankly, in the, in the Southwest sector. There's really no substitute for physical presence and the kind of uh, in physical interaction, day-to-day -day interaction that can take place. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Ms. Songus. We now proceed to Congressman Mo Brooks of Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At Redstone Arsenal next to Huntsville, Alabama, the Army is establishing a cyber campus within the Aviation and Missile Research Development and Engineering Center, also known as MRDEC. This campus consists of qualified cyber personnel and facilities to provide world-class cybersecurity support to aviation and missile systems by using cutting-edge research and development of cybersecurity solutions to challenges associated with emerging and legacy technologies. The MRDEC Cyber Campus coordinates cyber activities with industry, academia, and government partners. Although an Army asset, it is uniquely positioned to integrate the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the Space and Missile Defense Command, and the Defense Industrial Base. Additionally, it can provide deep technical expertise and reduce the risk of cyber threats posed as it relates to hardware, software, firmware, networks, tests, and evaluation, modeling, simulations, forensics, industrial control systems, supervisory control, and data acquisition systems. Uh, with that as a backdrop, and these questions are for uh, each of you, how does the Army's vision with MRDEC integrate with the Department of Defense's overall cyber strategy? Well, as Admiral Rogers said, each of the services are developing uh, cyber skills within each of the, uh, under their Title X responsibilities. And this is just one reflection of many, many, many uh, such organizations that are being set up. Uh, the Air Force has uh, 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 units down in San Antonio. Uh, and so I would ask Admiral Rogers to give you more specifics, but each of these are going to have specific skills. In this case, the one that you have uh, talked about, Congressman, really focuses on the aviation systems of the Army and how they can make sure that they are not uh, vulnerable to cyber attack, and, but they develop other skills too. Um, so every service, as the Secretary had indicated, is, general, is developing a similar kind of capability, similar kinds of relationships. Army has chose to really harness the capability resident at Redstone and in the northern Alabama area. Um, the positive side thing for me is we've got a good, strong collaboration across the services as to who is doing what and where. The question I think increasingly for us over time is, as we get more experience, do we need to increase investments in certain areas where we're really seeing strong results versus other areas where perhaps it hasn't played out as well as we would like? And we'll get generate more insights in that over time. Thank you, Mr. Halverson. Would you like to add anything? Policy absolutely talks about how we do better with industry, and part of what that unit is doing is bringing in industry in the area, too, to be part of the, pro the solution to the problem. So I think they're perfectly aligned with what they said and what was in the policy. Okay, follow-up question. Is there a consolidated effort to ensure cyber centers, such as the one at Redstone, are interconnected with other services and Department of Defense capabilities to properly leverage knowledge sets and not create stovepipes of information or efforts? Um, I don't know that we have a formal, I know there's uh, regular analytic and collaborative venues where they all get together. I participate and my team participates in some of those. I don't know that there's a 
a formal process, um, if you will. I try to synchronize that at my level with each of the service components that work for me about, hey, we gotta look at ourselves as one integrated enterprise here, guys, because we've gotta maximize effectiveness and efficiency because there's more requirements and there's money and time. So it's all about how do we maximize outputs. Mr. Work. Sir, I don't believe there is a formal uh, program right now. Uh, we look at it more in terms of function. So right now, I can tell you, in terms of defense of networks, everything is under on the same playing field. We all have the same scorecards. We all grade ourselves exactly the same. But to your specific question on whether or not we have a formal program, uh, that's something I'll need to go back and uh, research and say, is, uh, it sounds like a good idea. I just don't know uh, exactly uh, how we would implement it yet. Mr. Halverson. Uh, no, I think Secretary uh, enabled it. We'll have to go check and see. It sounds intriguing. Thank you, gentlemen, for your insight. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. We now proceed to Congressman O'Rourke of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Work, you were talking about the, the three basic tenets of deterrence. Uh, and uh, the, the first two, d denial and resilience, I understand pretty well. There have been a number of questions about uh, the third one, which is cost imposition. And I'm interested in knowing how we communicate or advertise the consequences of cyber attacks to potential adversaries. And to the degree that you can talk about it, how has that changed their behavior? And how have some of the consequences that we've imposed thus far changed their behavior? In other words, how do we how do how how have we done on that third tenant on cost imposition? Well, the first is to have a strong policy statement that we will respond at a time, place, and manner of our choosing, uh, and then we have to communicate primarily with state actors. Uh, I think Admiral Rogers said yesterday we're pretty good at stopping 99.5 percent of the attacks. We've you know getting rid of the the basic hacker, but it's the state adversaries that pose the biggest challenge. And I'd just like to weave in, uh, uh, I think the chairman mentioned the Xi and President Obama and uh, President Xi, the cyber agreement. And that came about from intensive discussions with the government of China saying, this behavior is unacceptable and we've got to come to grips with it. So there were four specific aspects of what I would consider this to call a confidence building measure. The first one is that we have to have timely response for information and assistance if we go to the China and say, hey, there is an actor inside China that is conducting these activities, we've agreed to share that information. Uh, both the United States and China have agreed uh, that they will not knowingly conduct cyber-related theft of intellectual property for commercial gain. Uh, we're making common effort to develop these norms of state, of norms of, of behavior, which we've never done before. Um, and then we agree to a high-level joint dialogue. Now, people say, well, there's no enforcement mechanism, but it's a confidence-building measure, and it is the first time that the president of China has said, I will commit my government to these things. We believe it's very, very significant and could lead to this. And it came about from high-level dialogue where we were saying, we find your behavior unacceptable. And we do have options, but how can we work this out? So I believe in the Sony case, we attributed, we did sanctions. Uh, I believe that those type of activities will prove that the United States is very serious about this and may lead to these better norms of behavior between nation states. I, I think that's the hope. What, what are you actually seeing in terms of changed behaviors? I understand the agreement, which is important, and the statements of intent. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of um, number and severity of intrusions or cyber attacks following, uh, you know, letting our adversaries know that we will choose the place and time of our response and having responded in some of these cases, what has that done? So we're in an unclassified forum, but in broad terms. To the degree that you um, can. You haven't seen the North Koreans attempt to engage in another offensive act against U.S. infrastructure since November of 14 in the aftermath of our economic sanctions and very public attribution and discussion. Um, I would argue, um, and at least the, the denial of service activity, we saw the Iranians, for example, doing back in the 2012, 2013 timeframe. We have not um, observed that of late. 
Um, I would argue for other nation states, the impact to date has been, I have not seen significant changes. Again, it's early with respect to the PRC. We need to see how this commitment plays out over time and trust me, we'll be paying great attention to how this commitment plays out over time. I, th I think that's something that uh, I and, and perhaps other members of the committee would be interested in uh, receiving a briefing on going forward just to, to look at how behaviors are changing and whether that third tenet of, of ensuring that our adversaries understand the consequences and cost of these kinds of attacks, making sure that that's really working. So appreciate your answers, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. And thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. We now proceed to Congresswoman Jackie Walorski of Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral Rogers, I just I have a question. You said earlier that Russia is a peer competitor in terms of our cyber technology and the cyber threats that are out there. And I guess I'm interested to see what you what your perspective is. I'm just sitting here and I've been watching through the course of this hearing the Russian bombers that let loose today in Syria with one hour notice to our generals in Baghdad and um, striking non ISIS targets. And I think this is a reprehensible activity that's happening today. And I have many questions as to how we ended up here. But I'm curious from you, with this development today of an overaggressive Russia, how in the world do we go forward with talking about uh, peer competitors and sharing intel information and trusting anything that comes from Putin and Russia? Well, clearly your point is much broader than the cyber arena that I'm I think it's completely related. Okay. I didn't say it was unrelated. I said it was broader. Um, one of the points I try to make is you have to remember that cyber happens in a broader strategic context, so it's important that we understand the broader strategic But context. would there not be an element of trust that would have to prevail here when we just literally saw what happened this morning? And for many of us that have sat here on this committee for a long time, saw a red line that was violated and not upheld in Syria. We've seen all these different gaps with all these different countries around the world with an administration that seems to not have any kind of a strategy or a contiguous plan. How would we take a step forward today? I know you're looking at the broad context, you're talking about the broad context, but I don't understand the gap that's going to the be there that's already been there, but the gap that's going to continue to emerge today. How in the world do we breach that? And how in the world do we say to the American people with all seriousness and looking our constituents in the eyes that we have their back and that we're looking out for the security of the United States of America and our allies and we're watching Vladimir Putin come right into the Middle East right next to our uh, cohort and friend that we want to protect Israel. Does that not change the equation of trusting or having any kind of semblance of trust with Putin and Russia? Well, I'd only argue this latest issue fits in a broader context with the Ukraine and others. This is not a new phenomenon in many ways with this particular actor. It's why we've been very direct with them. I know Secretary, the Secretary has had conversations with his counterparts in the Russian framework. I have not had specific cyber discussions with them. I will say one of the points I try to make in our internal discussions is I'm watching the Russians use cyber in an ever increasingly aggressive way. And you would this not be a major alarm? This is alarming to me that he just uh, talked to the president yesterday and evidently said, stay out of our airspace. When we get one hour of warning and they go in and they attack S Syria. So now they are a main stake player as we're screwing around in our country. We're fighting back and forth over all kinds of things right now. We just had the Pope here. And while America's distraction focuses over here, it's seemingly that he's using a phenomenal window of opportunity to go and be in his another major push now in Syria. And the alarm, I think, not only for lawmakers today, but for the citizens of our country that we're vowing to protect, is we have now watched him establish himself in Syria, in the Middle East. It's, um, obviously, as outlined by President Putin, he believes he is following his national interests. We are alarmed by what happened this morning. Uh, what was agreed by the two presidents is that our militaries would talk so that we would deconflict operations. So have we not seen a failure between our, our president and President Putin if we were going to talk and, and try to avoid something like this? Because now he's there one hour one hour of notice I don't with all of our forces over there, the allied forces, the NATO forces, the other, the other nations that are fighting as well. I mean, would we not, would we not see this as a, as a failure? I don't believe it's a failure. I believe it's an aggressive action by Russia right now in advance of our discussions between our two militaries. And are you confident that we have a strategy with the president of the, of the United States that just met with Putin? Are you confident that, we, that those two leaders have a strategy? and that we're holding up our end of the bargain? Are you confident that 
that the administration is looking at this as, oh, well, we expected this to happen. I mean, I look at it as a gigantic breach because I represent three quarters of a million people. They're looking at their TVs right now like I am, and uh, the official response from the Pentagon taken aback by strikes. I think we're all taken aback. Is there a strategy that was supposed to prevent this? Or is our attitude now, well, we know they're going to go do their things. We're just going to see at what point we're going to try to contain them. We have a disagreement on strategy. They want to be able to do military action first, followed by a political agreement. They're doing military action. They've been doing military action. They encroach on the Ukraine. They're making headway through that whole Eastern European area. They've been doing military action. And today we're watching a live bombing. And, and from your perspective and the perspective of the administration, we expected that. The American people, don't, I don't expect that. The Russians made clear that they would uh, uh, support the Assad regime uh, with airstrikes, and we made an agreement to have our militaries talk so that there would not be any problem between our interactions between our forces. Do you think one hour of notice no, is, is legitimate for two organizations and militaries that are talking? They obviously the talks broke down and we got a last minute. So what is our response now? Well. Uh, you have me at a disadvantage, Congresswoman. I don't know exactly what has happened over the last hour. We heard about the attacks this morning. Uh, they asked us to, to avoid the area where they would be operating. We continue to fly throughout Syria. And we continue, continue to our... talk? Are we continuing to talk to our, to our Russian counterponents? We have agreed for our militaries to meet, and that meeting just simply has not occurred. This was an agreement between the two presidents just a couple days ago. So we are trying to find out where we will meet, where it will be, uh, who what Would you not decide. agree this is a crisis? Because for the first time, they have now entered the Middle East. And for the first time, we now have watched the, the broadening of Putin's powers, who is just here on the American soil, right next to a mess, a hotbed of war, and right next to our dear ally, Israel. Have we not now watched something elevate to the point that it, this is now a crisis because Russia has just now gone from their position through the Ukraine, looking at Eastern Europe, and now has sufficiently landed themselves with a coalition inside of Syria? I do not believe it's a crisis. I believe it's a disagreement between, in strategy and that is what we're trying to work out. And I, and I respect that. I believe it is a crisis. I believe we've had a president with no foreign policy whatsoever. We've had red lines talked about and crossed, and this thing has played out all by itself. And now today, here we are, back in a crisis, back on TV in front of every single American, wondering who in the world is defending our country. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Jackie Walorski. Uh, we now proceed to Mr. Takai. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, rebalance and refocus to cyber strategy, if I may. Um, a lot of my colleagues have asked about deterrence today, and this is something that I'm also very concerned about after recent events uh, that have been discussed. With, with the current threats to our cyber network, the need to discuss here today, including uh, creating and maintaining a persistent training environment development of a unified platform and building the joint information environment to secure the DOD enterprise. The development of these priorities cannot only serve as a deterrent in their own right, but will enable our cybercom, our cyber mission force readiness to be the best in the world. So Admiral Rogers, where is DOD in allocating resources for these priorities? If you could address each one. Again, persistent training environment, unified platform, and the joint information environment. So persistent training environment is a program that we have put together. It'll take us several years to finish. I think we're in the, th this little 17 represents the third year of funding for it. We're working through the 17 build now internally within the department. Again, I sense strong support for this. I haven't come to an issue yet where I'm saying, oh, I, I have problems with the way ahead. I think we got a way ahead and it seems to be working. GIE, I'll let Terry comment it only because it's a, been a particular focus for he. <clears throat> Unified platform, a relatively new idea for us that based on five years of practical experience now as an organization, we think the department needs to create a capability somewhat separate from NSA, if you will, for us to execute operations. Uh, Unified platform is the program name we've put together in terms of our ability to do that. Again, we really are starting that with the 17 build. And it's an example to me of how as we gain more experience, as we do this over time, we gotta continually reassess and ask ourselves, so are some of the assumptions that we made when we started, are they proving to be what we thought they were or do we need to make changes? 
Okay, and, and, and then uh, JIE, if you want to. Uh, with respect to JIE, the first concrete action that becomes of that is the establishment of the joint regional security stacks. They are on track. They will be funded in 17, and they will be fully operational by the end of 17. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to uh, go back to uh, the integration of personnel. Uh, I know the Secretary mentioned it, and I think you, Admiral, as well. Uh, I want to focus on defining where the role of the National Guard uh, fits into the cyber strategy. Uh, I'm a member of the Guard uh, in Hawaii, and all of us here on this committee have constituents in the Guard. So can you touch upon some of the points on where the Guard can increase their role in the larger cyber mission? Well, let me uh, uh, just start by saying our cyber force that we're building to, as we discussed earlier, Congressman, is about 6,200 active and civilians and in some special cases contractors. Right. So that's uh, what you said, the Secretary. You didn't mention National Guard when you said that. 2,000. 2,000 okay. National Guard and reserves on top of that. Uh, some of them will be part of the cyber teams that I talked about, and others will be extra capacity that might be able to help the states. As I said, the Council of Governors and, uh, and we have been working very, very closely together. Our policy shop has uh, worked out, is working through all of the aspects of what we can do <laughs> under Title 32 and Title 10 authorities in support of the states, but the Guard and Reserves will be absolutely central uh, to the cyber mission force, about a quarter of the entire force, 6,200 in the active side and another 2,000 on the Reserve and National Guard. So they are absolutely central. The only other comment I would make, and I say this, I am a son of a guardsman. My father was a member of the Illinois National Guard for 27 years. So as a child, this, I watched him every day, every month, every summer participate in, in guards activity. I spent a lot of time playing in armories as a little boy with my father. Um, Every service has, done, has used a slightly different construct. In the case of the Air Force, they are using the Guard and the Reserve to fill out a part, if you will, of the, the active requirement for their share of the 6,200. In the case of the Army, they have decided that the Guard and the Reserve represent an opportunity to generate additional capacity over and above that dedicated 6,200 people. Clearly, Navy and Marine Corps don't have a Guard construct. So it's a little different for them. I mean, as I've said, the discussions today have been very good. I think, as the Secretary said, we got a way ahead in terms of how we're going to work our way through this, particularly this, quote, additional capacity, if you will, that the Guard is developing and partnering with the states about how we're going to view this as one integrated enterprise, as it were, so we're maximizing the capabilities that the Department and the states are investing in. So you spoke earlier about the cyber teams and the number of teams that you're building. I understand that there may be, in fact, a opportunities for these teams to be wholly guard. Uh, you didn't mention that today, so can you explain? I said in the case of the Air Force, for example, a portion of their share of the 133, they in fact are creating a small number of teams that are wholly okay. guard. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, one more question for the Secretary. How, how resilient are, are our military networks to cyber attacks and how do you measure and qualify, qual qualify resilience? We are getting better, but we not, we're not where we need to be. That is why Secretary Carter has said defense of our networks is absolutely number, job number one. Now, that will come through a whole lot of different things, as I said in my opening statement. First, uh, get the network as defendable as possible. So the JIE that uh, Terry Halverson talked about and the Joint Regional Security Stacks will take 1,000 defendable firewalls down to less than 200. Um, uh, a whole bunch of different, uh, I mean, the number of enclaves, and Terry can talk about this, will be dropped. So the first thing is to make your uh, network uh, with the surfaces, as uh, the fewest surfaces as possible and as defendable as possible. The second is to build up these teams, uh, so that is a, another big part. And the other one is to have a cyber scorecard, which is telling us exactly how well we are doing. And Mr. Halverson was the uh, the creator of this scorecard, and if I'd ask him to be able to tell you how we're going to track this. Cyber resiliency is actually a measure on the scorecard that we are actively developing. It will look at... Gentleman's time's expired. Chair now recognizes himself for uh, questions. Uh, Secretary Work and Admiral Mike Rogers, uh, good to meet you. Uh, do you use telecommunications, and either one of you, uh, telecommunications equipment manufactured by Huawei in your offices? 
I apologize, I didn't hear the question. Do you use telecommunications equipment manufactured by Huawei in your offices? In the office of the Secretary of Defense, absolutely not. And I know, no. know of no other, I don't believe we uh, operate in the Pentagon, any, any systems in the Pentagon. Admiral Rogers? No. Why? Correct, same. Why do you not use it? Um, for us, I think it's a broader conscious decision as we look at supply chain and we look at uh, potential vulnerabilities within the system that it's a risk we felt was unacceptable. Secretary Work, agree with Admiral Rogers. <laughs> what about your uh, d cleared defense contractor? Should they be using Huawei telecommunications equipment? I'll have to take that for the record, uh, sir. Uh, I know of no defense contractors that are using, uh, using Huawei equipment, but I just don't know. Okay. Admiral. Um, I, I, this is a broader de departmental issue. I mean, we don't, the contracts we have, we specify security standards that you have to meet. We, we specify the requirement to notify us. Again, I think we'd have to take it as a question. I don't know if the current language, and Terry may know, but I don't know if the current language specifies specific vendors, if you will, you may or may not. I know in some of the national security systems, we are very specific about making that standard in the nuclear and other areas. We're very explicit that that is not allowable. Well, I, I, Secretary Work, I would appreciate if you could get back with me on whether you have any uh, clear defense contractors that are compelled to use Huawei telecommunications equipment. Uh, and with that, uh, my next question has to do with uh, uh, the Nuclear Enterprise Review that recognized that Vietnam era UE-1N helicopters that help provide security for our ICBM fields are woefully antiquated and inadequate. The NER said that we need to get new modern helicopters to into ICBM fields because, after all, we're talking about nuclear weapons. Uh, based on a meeting I had with the Air Force and the OSD a few weeks ago, I'm very concerned uh, that the Air Force acquisition approach is going to take four or more years to get these helicopters. Now, these are ICBM fields. And I had a hearing on uh, this security issue, and this came up, and it's alarming the concern that we are being told by the commanders about their security of these fields. What can you tell me about why we're looking at such a long period of time? Well, first of all, this is an extremely high priority, and we are dealing with it right now in PBR-17. Last year, the Air Force plan to replace those helicopters was to uh, take their UH-60As, their old there, I mean, excuse me, take UH-60As and upgrade them to UH-60Ls, and it turned out that all of the As that were available in the force were just too old and tired, became cost uh, prohibitive. And that's why the time timing slid, because now we will have to go and buy new build UH-60Ms or whatever helicopter we decide, uh, whether we decide whether we can do sole source or whether it has to be a competition. Uh, uh, Strat Commander, the uh, commander of U.S. Uh, Strategic Command, Cecil Haney, Admiral Cecil Haney, has come in and said, we cannot afford to wait for four years, and we are looking at a wide variety of measures to uh, mitigate the problem until we can get these new helicopters built. It's a very high priority uh, issue for us in this budget build, and I'll be able to uh, give you a little bit more information once we work through all of the different options before us. Okay. Well, I just want you to understand that I really believe that we should see an immediate reprogramming request for the uh, FY17 uh, budget. And with that, uh, I will uh, close by saying that I, now that the NDAA is uh, about to be sent to the president, I would like to talk with you offline about uh, our new engine uh, to replace the RD-180 uh, as soon as we get a chance to privately. With that, I will uh, yield back my time and go to uh, Ms. Spruill. For five Spear. minutes. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service uh, to our country. You know, we're dealing with some very, very savvy actors in these various um, foreign countries that have been hacking into us. On the agreement with China, Mr. Wark, you seem somewhat elated by the agreement, and yet I have reason to be very um, skeptical about them complying with what they agreed to comply with. Uh, but more importantly, I would like to ask you, what isn't in the agreement that you would have wished was in the agreement? Well, I wouldn't characterize my, uh, 
my reaction is elation, uh, Congresswoman, so much as I believe it is a very good first step. It's the first time that the President of China has committed himself and his country to address the issues that have been of such high concern to our government. So I consider that a very good All right, I understand step. that, but what wasn't in the agreement? I have very limited time, so please, if you would, a answer the question. There were no enforcement mechanisms per se, and that, I think, is the key um, thing that people have pointed out. But again, I believe this was a confidence-building measure. Now China is either going to prove that they are serious about this or not, and then we can take actions as necessary if they prove not to uh, follow through on their commitment. Now, the OPM hack was devastating. Um, and it's, it's clear that China did it. They denied it. It's also very clear that they now have very personal information about uh, many persons with top secret status. And the phishing that just went on recently of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, unclassified email um, worries me a great deal. Whether it's Russia or China, access to that personal information is such that if they know who your family members are or who your next door neighbor is, and they then can pretend like they are your family member or next door neighbor, you're more apt to click onto that email and then they can get in. What steps are being taken to deal with phishing in terms of either requiring um, greater accountability by those who hold those positions who end up clicking by either punishing them or coming up with some system so that we can anticipate that kind of fishing going on and prevent it. I would just like to make an overall point and then turn it over to um, Mike and Terry. Although our adversaries have very sophisticated capabilities in this regard, almost every one of these intrusions that have occurred have occurred because of simple operator error, bad cyber hygiene. They click on a, uh, they click on a spear phishing attempt. So. We are going after that. I'd just like to say that that is the biggest problem we have right now, is getting our cyber hygiene better. Okay, so, but my point is that what kind of, is there any kind of penalty being imposed on those who, in a careless manner, click onto them? The, the simple answer is yes, and I, I won't go into the specifics of what has been imposed, but it, yes, we have upped the level of accountability on that, and actions have been taken for people who have misbehaved in a cyber way. Secondly, we have increased the training um, frequency of phishing training, and we have taken certain actions on the networks to eliminate the ability to click on links, and at a minimum, we have a warning on there now that says you must think about this link. And in some cases, and again, I want to specific, you physically can no longer click on links via any of our networks. And I would say from a network perspective, I've implemented nine specific technical changes where, quite frankly, I've told users now, I'm going to make your life harder. If this is what it takes to drive a change in behavior, I will make your user life harder to try to preclude this from happening. My last question, um, and very briefly, what's keeping you up at night? So I'd say from my perspective, there's three things in cyber that concern me. Are we going to see offensive activity taken against U.S. critical infrastructure? Are we going to see the focus shift from theft of intellectual property, the theft of information, to manipulation of the data that's in our system so we no longer can trust what we see? And then the third thing that worries me is are we going to see non-state actors, be terrorist groups, that are probably at the forefront of my mind, start to use the web as an offensive weapon. Thank you. I would add two things. One, we have a large number of systems, uh, Congresswoman, that were built in an era like uh, Admiral Rogers that was not, they, the, the systems were not built uh, to withstand the cyber environment that we're in now. So what keeps me up is night, or can we get through all of our systems and make sure that they do have cyber hardening? Going forward, we're making sure that there are uh, key performance parameters in every system we have but we have to go through this risk mitigation on every one of our systems and saying, what is the critical cyber vulnerability? Have we taken care of it? And I would just like to echo, it's the manipulation of data since we rely upon our networks that really keeps me up at night. Chairman Lee's time's expired. The chair now recognizes Chairman Whitman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Secretary Work, I want to begin with getting your perspective on how we address the cyber threat. 
We have constructed a military that is very adept and capable of addressing kinetic threats, and that is top to bottom capability. We have generalists, we have specialists. When enlistees come in, they learn the lessons and training about what to do in that kinetic environment. We have our officers that learn tactics and, and strategy within that environment. Yet it seems we have a very myopic or piecemeal element with the cyber threat. Give me your perspective. Shouldn't we have the same top to bottom ca capability and capacity for cyber? Shouldn't our enlisted men and women come in? Shouldn't they also get training in the cyber realm? Shouldn't our curriculums at our service academies include very robust and extensive instruction and education within the cyber realm? How do we construct a force that is as capable kinetically as it should be in the cyber realm? And we're far behind and we need to be catching up. Give me your perspective on what, how should we do that? Is that valuable to do? And what are you doing to get to that particular point? Congressman, it's very valuable. The first thing is to include uh, the, what we call this is improving the cyber hygiene of the entire force, making every single member, active duty, civilians, contractors, and reserves to understand the cyber threat that we face each day and to understand the simple actions they can take to improve our security. I think many of the things that you say uh, we, in our, all of our education and our schools, uh, cyber is now an important part of our curriculum. Uh, we have red teams that are going out and helping commanders understand uh, where their vulnerabilities are and how they can improve. Uh, we have different types of means by which we hold people accountable for, uh, like if you have a negligent discharge with a weapon, mm -hmm. that is a bad thing. We want everybody to know that a negligent discharge in cyber is almost, I mean, is, could be as dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with what you're saying, and this is a big, big cyber, uh, a cyber cultural shift that Admiral Rogers spoke to earlier. And I would just echo, that's the approach we're taking. This is so foundational to the future for us as a department in terms of our ability to execute our missions that the nation is counting on, that we've got to do this foundationally across the spectrum. Yeah. We don't need the same level of training that the dedicated cyber mission force right. has, but there has got to be a level of yeah. basic cyber awareness across our entire force, regardless of rank. Last comment, this is the one environment in which if we have given you access to a keyboard, mm -hmm. you now represent a potential point of vulnerability. Yeah and everyone in our department that numbers in the millions in terms of the active component, contractors, civilians, reservists, guard, everyone is an operator in this environment. In that, in that realm, that priority also has to be reflected in how resources are dedicated. Give me your perspective. Where are we dedicating resources for things like MILCON for cyber, uh, within personnel, within training, within hardware and software? I think it's also reflected not only in what you're doing from a doctrine standpoint, a philosophy standpoint, and training standpoint, but where are you dedicating resources to make sure that you, that you are successfully uh, meeting that objective? Well, uh, when Secretary Carter was the Deputy Secretary filling the job that I fill now, starting around FY13, I believe, there was a, a concerted effort to try to increase the uh, uh, investment in cyber forces, uh, I believe that we're doing very well in this regard. We could always do more. It's budget dependent. But as I said earlier in the uh, in testimony, Secretary Carter says wherever our budget ends up, cyber is going to be a very, very top priority. The one area where I think we could do better on is in tools. Mm -hmm. I think we are focused. We had to build the human capital mm -hmm. first, which we have been doing very well. But if there's one area where I think we could do better for Admiral Rogers and the team, is to invest more money in tools that he would be able to then uh, create better options for the force. And I would echo, I think we're very doing a very good job with the dedicated cyber mission force in terms of the commitment to bring in online, where I think we're going to need to look at over time, as the Secretary said, the things I've raised are tools, situational awareness, persistent training environment, the unified platform, mm -hmm. and then asking ourselves over time, is the manpower piece right? Is the command and control structure that we've put in, in place right? And this is part of an ongoing process. What I try to remind people is look, cyber is an environment in which where we are today is not where we're gonna wind up. And we gotta stop focusing on the 100% solution up front. We gotta take this in bite-sized chunks and keep moving out. Very good. 
If you could, just for the record, I'd love to see a breakdown about uh, what you're proposing in resource allocation now, what your projection is in the future to make sure we are building that capability. And you talked about the time element. Time in this, I think, is critical. So getting your perspective on how you're going to accomplish that, both strategically within the planning sense, but also in allocation of resources is going to be critical. I'll take that for the record, sir. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, I recognize Mr. Ashford for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, and many of my questions have been asked and answered, but I want to pick up on something that Admiral Rogers and Mr. W uh, Work mentioned a few minutes ago about the government shutdown. I, you know, and I, I've been sitting here since February, and I admire everybody on this committee and, and the witnesses, and it's, I've learned a great deal. I've been here eight months or whatever. Um, it, I, I'm from Nebraska. It is absolutely unfathomable. It is beyond belief. It is incomprehensible that this government or this Congress or anybody would even begin to talk about shutting down the government I, 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 uh, for whatever political gain they may get. And, uh, you know, I, we were in the Middle East in, in, in February, and at the beginning of the, not the beginning of the ISIS uh, effort, but certainly it was, it was the beginning, in the beginning stages of our effort to com, uh, combat ISIS. And, and we were in, we were in Baghdad, and and uh, there was discussion at that point about standing up a a, a force uh, to address uh, social media issues. Uh, it was at the very very beginning uh, beginnings of that, at least in Baghdad, of getting both civilian and and military personnel up to speed on what was going on with ISIS and social media. And uh, and it, and we're now in October, and uh, and I know this is a little bit of a of a speech, and I apologize, but. It, it seems to me at that time I came back with a sense of all the things we talk about in Congress now and all the discussion about uh, shutting down the government and all these other issues. I understand this is democracy. We can talk about what we want to talk about. But I, I kept thinking to myself, why don't we debate and discuss and at least give to the military, every branch of the military, some clear plan and understanding of where we want to go with not only ISIS but in the Middle East generally it seems to me that we are reacting uh, to these various incidents. We're reacting to what the Russians did today because, uh, for whatever, these existential threats are there, these other threats are there. It seems to me it's incumbent upon us in Congress to clearly indicate to you what we want you to do and, and where we want you to go, because I think that is totally lacking. And th this week, with all the things that went on uh, with the, uh, in, in, the, in the House, um, I just kept thinking to myself, what, what, are the, what are our military thinking about, about we can't get our house in order, we can't, <laughs> we can't operate. And going back to my, uh, my service in Nebraska, uh, they look at me like we're nuts. You know, we're sending our military, we're, we're, we're asking them to do almost an impossible task around the globe, and we're bickering about stuff that has nothing to do with giving you the capabilities you need to go forward. So anyway, I've said enough. So here's my, here's my picking up on your third point about, about um, the social media issue, and that, the third thing that keeps you up at night. What's your analysis of where we are in, in the next minute and 56 seconds, where we are, Admiral Rogers, where we are with that uh, third element, and how you see that evolving? Um, I think we need to do a better job of contest contesting ISIL in the information dynamic. Their ability in the information arena is every bit as important in many ways as their battlefield successes. And we have clearly focused a, a large piece of our strategy on trying to stop and forestall that battlefield activity level. I think we're going to need to do the same thing in the information dynamic because part of their ability to get out their story their propaganda, their vision of the world around us, we need to contest that. I ISIL is as much an idea in many ways right. as it is a physical presence, uh, simplistically, on, right. on the ground. And how's that going? Clearly not where we want it to be. Um, m multiple components across the government ongoing, don't get me wrong. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say we have not achieved yet the, the impact that we think we need to have and the, certainly the impact that we want to have. And Congressman, if I could just say that uh, what your opening st uh, statement certainly resonates with uh, Secretary Carter and me. Um, strategy is all about balancing in ways and means, and when you have no idea what your means are, it's almost impossible to have a good strategy. As I said earlier today, you know, in the last six years, we're in a situation where we think a continuing resolution 
is a better deal than a government shutdown, and it is. But it's certainly not something that I, as a COO, would say I would want to operate under. In the last six years, essentially what we have is a nine-month fiscal year because every first quarter we're in a CR. And that means that we are limited to do what you told us to do last year rather than doing what the things we need to do this year. Yeah. It is an incredible situation. And there is no member of Congress in any House, in any party, that would sit in my job as a COO and say, we can make this work without compromising our national security. Yeah. So I'm sorry I, I'm on the soapbox, but this is something that we deal with every day. We hope that we won't have a government shutdown. We hope that the CR will be uh, taken care of in a very soon, uh, very quick manner. My, my time's up, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Chair, I recognize Ms. McSally for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. And now that you're on the topic, I want to make sure I'm on the record that I, uh, after serving 26 years in uniform and seeing government shutdowns and continuing resolutions and the impact that that has on us, our ability to do our mission, I've um, been strongly advocating against shutting down the government, strongly advocating for us doing our job and actually passing appropriations bills so that you guys can plan, uh, you can strategize, you can execute the mission. And uh, I would urge all of my colleagues, if you want to keep the government open, you need to vote to keep the government open. And that would be my urge to them today. Uh, those of us who understand what that means are going to do that, but we'd appreciate a large number of my colleagues actually showing some courage and joining us. Uh, anyway, on to the issues at hand. Uh, prior to running for Congress, I was a professor at the George C. Marshall Center, uh, one of our defense uh, security centers. And one of the last courses that I uh, participated in was a senior executive seminar related to uh, cybersecurity, cyberterrorism. And so in your uh, strategy, you uh, talk about building and maintaining robust alliances, partnerships. Obviously, this is uh, you know, a global domain. And so they're now starting a, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Phil Lark, retired uh, Marine colonel, is starting a program on cybersecurity studies, or he's, he's uh, leading that effort. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to how the defense security centers fit in with this strategy, uh, how you uh, feel as far as resources in order to use tools like these uh, security centers, like the Marshall Center, uh, to execute that strategy, and whether you need new authorities or additional resources uh, in that venue. Um, well, first of all, these uh, different centers are very vital. Part of our strategy, regardless of what the level of uh, resources are, Congresswoman, is partnerships yep. and establishing strong partnerships. And as Admiral Rogers and Terry have said, this is a collaborative environment mm -hmm. that we all face the same threats and need to operate together. Right. So I don't know if there are any uh, authorities that uh, Mike would ask to help us work uh, more deeply with our partners, uh, but I know that we are doing so and very aggressively. I, I would uh, say it, uh, resources as well. Yeah. Right. It hasn't been an authorities issue as much in the case specifically of the Marshall Center. Mm -hmm. General Breedlove, in fact, has asked both I and the department you know, for assistance and, hey, this is important to me. I think it will generate good outcomes for us in Europe as we're right. trying to understand the broader cyber environment. So I've committed to General Breedlove, hey, look, I, I will be there to provide expertise to help because that's what I can bring, not necessarily money. Um, we're working our, I don't think I or us off the top of our head know the specifics uh, other than the fact that we've committed to, to moving forward on it. I know it's ongoing. Yeah, and I will tell you, having been there, and sometimes we have um, senior officials from 45 different countries. Um, this is not a, it's not a technical course. It's more of an awareness of best practices, policy issues, especially for some of our less capable partners. They're not going to ever have a cyber command like we do, but if we can raise their game up a bit and we can uh, have better collaboration and coordination uh, for strategic understanding, best practices, how to quickly alert and respond and working with each other uh, intel-wise, uh, threat-wise, I think it goes a long way. I mean, I was very impressed with uh, the capabilities that we have there, and I would think that it's a little bit of an investment for a, a potentially huge strategic outcomes. We agree with you completely. I would just say some of that work is related. Um, Mike will be doing some things, but uh, over the next two months, we'll be in NATO uh, working to do exactly that with some right. of the part raising their cyber basics. Right. We'll be in uh, um, Bulgaria doing the same thing, and some of that is a result of some of the arrangements that were worked frequently from the Marshall Center. Yeah, great. But that is paying back some good dividends. Excellent. I look forward to working uh, with you in the future if you uh, have any other additional requests related to that with the firsthand experience that I have. So not, not just the Marshall Center, but the other defense centers, obviously, because this is a global issue. So thank you, uh, gentlemen. I appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair and I recognize Mr. Duckworth for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I'm very um, interested in looking at cyber vulnerabilities in our critical infrastructure. Um, uh, I'd love to drill down more specifically to our bases and installations that support core warfighting functions. Um, I feel that they face the similar threats. Um, uh, our installations are tied into local grids, uh, rely on sewage and water from the surrounding areas. So there's always potential for impact for those um, uh, basic uh, life services on the base. Um, uh, certainly continuity of operations is critical for DOD just as it is for our civilian infrastructure. Um, I, Admiral, I'd, I'd like for you to sort of address this, and, and I'm going to give you an example that I found deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, I took a tour of um, a, a contractor, that um, a wonderful company that works in um, smart grid technology. And as part of this tour of this facility, um, small business, uh, they were very proud to show me what they were doing. They won a contract at one of our facilities, one of our bases, actually the base for a major, I won't say which base it is, because this is not a, a secret uh, 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 room, but um, it was a major, it was the home for a major maneuver division in the Army. And uh, from another state where I was, uh, I watched them turning off the lights. Uh, at that base. And then when I asked uh, the person who was operating the computer who was turning on and off, the lights on and off at this base, um, I said, do you have a secret clearance? They said, no. I said, do you as a company um, uh, have anybody with a secret clearance? Yes, the chief engineer does, but this was an unsecure room. People in the business were coming in and out and they were very, I mean, amazing technology that's going to help us save tons of money when it comes to environmental uh, costs and, and energy efficiency and all those good things as a Democrat I, I love. Um, but I was deeply, deeply concerned that I was sitting there watching them turn the lights on and off on a major road, on a major installation of a major maneuver division command in the Army. Um, uh, Admiral, if you could speak a little bit to um, perhaps uh, what you're doing to both coordinate with installations command for each of the different branches, whether it is the Army's uh, installation management command, the Marine Corps installation command, um, and also um, local civilian uh, uh, infrastructure as well. And, and by the way, this base, is outside of a major metropolitan city. Right. It's not one of you know. It's not not one of the army bases that's out in the middle of nowhere. I spent a lot of time in those myself, but I was deeply concerned. So um, we share your concern. The services and installation and their respective installation commands are working with each individual installation. I was in, I have been an installation commander myself in the course of my career, so I have experienced this as a commander. When you're so dependent in some ways on infrastructure and capability that is outside your immediate span and control, and yet it directly derives your ability to execute your mission. It's one of the reasons why collectively in the department we ask ourselves, so what are the capabilities we need to bring on the installation, if you will, to put redundancy and backups in so we have a level of control? We're working our way through this. The, the, the challenge I think we find is, again, it goes just the scope of the problem sets out there, just the infrastructure that we count on as a department, that just the broad swath of it, the size and the age of it in many ways as we're trying to collectively work our way through this. This is a problem set that's going to take us years to work our way through. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Do, do you have a liaison um, I'm from Cyber Command that sits at Installation Command for each of the branches of service? No. What I do is I work through my service components who partner with their Installation Command. So, for example, in my last job where I was the Navy's cyber individual reporting to U.S. Cyber Command, I was working directly with the Navy's installation command as to what we were doing at naval installations, you know, around the world for us, and we still do that now. Is there any policy that looks at, um, uh, and, and one of the great things about this committee is this is a very bipartisan committee, and I want to apply for his continuing work on acquisition reform. Uh, but one of the, my concerns with acquisition reform is these contractors and sub-subcontractors. Huawei, mm -hmm. uh, North American Regional Headquarters, is actually in my district. Right. Um, and, and I have concern that we are talking about service subcontractors that are several layers down, and we're not inspecting. I mean, there was nobody inspecting this contractor and, and making sure that they were, I mean, that, that they had, you know, secured the, the facilities and the computers and the devices and the people turning on, on and off uh, the, the lights at a major military base. Right. So we've taken the Huawei issue specifically for action. We'll provide feedback on that. I, this, I share your concern, ma'am. This is something we're going to have to just work our way through. What, what, what are you specifically, do you have plans in place? Are you writing policy? What are you doing specifically to address this particular issue? I apologize. Mike, let me take that one. Yeah. There, there, there is policy in place. We are looking at all of the installations and, frankly, grading them and looking for where the priorities. But it, as Mike said, this is a priority issue. There's a vast number of you know, installations 
very frankly, the control systems for power water, when they were built, there was no consideration of cyber. So now we have to go back and fix that. We have a list of the those priorities. Um, we are prioritizing on those bases that, um, that have more strategic assets first, which I think is smart, and we will keep going down that list to, to fix those issues. But there is a priority list. We have new language required in the FAR for all levels of contractors now to meet certain requirements about the security control systems, and that is in place. Can I have a copy of your priorities list and that new language for contractors? Is that available for members of Congress? Uh, we will certainly take that for record. I'm sure it is, and we'll figure out how to get it to you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognizes a uh, gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Rogers, I appreciate people like you that uh, put yourself uh, at risk and, and assiduously try to do everything you can to protect the homeland and, and uh, the future generations. And so on behalf of my children, thank you. Um, I'm going to paraphrase here, but in recent uh, press briefings at the Wilson Center, you said that uh, what keeps you up at night, and I know you've been asked that question several times today, are threats to critical infrastructure and that you've been you know, observing nation states spending a lot of time within the power structure of the United States. And uh, uh, as you know better than perhaps anyone, the Department of Defense relies upon the electric grid for 99% of its electricity needs, without which uh, even the department's position is that it cannot affect its mission. Um, and of course, there are 320 million Americans that also dependent upon it uh, pretty significantly for uh, everyday survival. Um, and a widespread collapse of the electric grid, of course, uh, would lead to um, gross societal collapse. <clears throat> so, uh, under your cyber, wearing your cyber uh, comm hat, uh, how protected is our electric grid from number one cyber attacks and the lesser discussed uh, attacks that could come from geomagnetic disturbance or electromagnetic pulse? Uh, and do you find industry to be a willing partner in helping to secure this, the grid? And what have you been tasked with or uh, coordinated with or asked to do from the Department of Homeland Security or FRC or the, the FERC, uh, Federal Ele uh, uh, Energy Regulatory Committee, uh, Com Commission, in regards to hardening the electric grid and protecting it and just giving us your best military advice? A lot of questions here, I'm sorry. Uh, what do you think needs to be accomplished to robustly harden our electric grid against these stated threats? So let me try to do them backwards to forwards. Um, remember, DOD does not um, physically act on private sector networks. I'm not responsible for hardening That's them. true, but without them, you'll certainly maybe revisit that. Right. M my only point is, your sp question specifically, though, is, so what are you doing as? And I go, well, that's not Cyber Command's role. What we do is we partner with DHS in their role. I try to make sure that, again, because of one of the missions you heard the Secretary talk about in the very beginning, where D there is an expectation that DOD needs to be ready to respond if the president decides that we have to respond to an, a cyber event, a significant consequence. A, a power scenario is definitely one of the things that we talk about. So we partner with DHS. We partner with the segment, for example. We do a CyberGuard annual exercise. I had two different power sector segments from two different parts of the United States that participated in this exercise. That was one of the scenarios we walked our way through. In terms of the grid, if you will, vulnerability, I would argue it's pretty broad. If you look in the eastern part of the United States, the grid's operating on the margins already just between capacity and demand. Um, the other point I try to make, particularly in the eastern part of the United States, is we need to think more than just the U.S. Our grid in the east in particular is so tied into our Canadian counterparts where hydroelectric and other power generation capacity on their side of the border often is flowing south to meet our basic needs. Um, the other challenge I find in the power sector is, and they're quick to remind me of this, is their business model. Hey, Admiral, we're a regulated industry. The only way for us to generate, ish, to generate revenue is through rates. Those are governed. I just can't universally say I'm going to up charges to generate a $5 billion capital fund that I can use to invest in basic infrastructure. So each of the utilities, if you will, within the sector is trying to work their way through it. Well, I appreciate that. I guess uh, one of the things over the years in, in dealing with this issue that has occurred to me is that uh, what you just said, and you're absolutely correct. I mean, you know, this is not your responsibility to tell the private sector what to do with the grid. 
But then the private sector, when we talk to them about hardening the grid for national security purposes, they say that's the national defense uh, apparatus's job. And in the meantime, this, what could be a profound threat, given the fact that all of our other security, our, our, our other uh, critical infrastructures rely heavily upon the grid, uh, it walks the 13th floor of uh, congressional debate and no one addresses it. And of course, you know, there's always a moment in the life of every problem when it is big enough to be seen and still small enough to be addressed. And I think we live in that window, so uh, I certainly don't uh, offer you any advice. Uh, just uh, the, the question I hope lingers in our minds is, are we doing what is um, relevant to protect uh, the national security on this particular threat? Because certainly a loss of the grid would be the ultimate cyber security issue. I mean, you know, if you, if you can't turn those computers on, you can't do really much else. And, and I, I, again, there's no arrogance in my, in my comments, uh, Admiral. I think that you're doing a great job and I hope you will consider this as much as possible. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, all of our members have completed their questions. I wanna thank the witnesses for their time and preparation for this hearing. I know it takes a lot to get ready for these and uh, your time here today, but it's been very beneficial to us. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>